بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه الطاهرين ما دام ما في السماوات والأرضين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله we thank and praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى for his many blessings that he has bestowed upon us and we beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in those blessings. By the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we continue with our reading of Imam Nawawi's Arba'in, the 40 foundational narrations. And this lesson introduces the second hadith, which is famously known as Hadith Jibril. Our lesson outcomes for today, bi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reads as follows. We're going to gain insight into the concepts of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. This hadith is a fairly lengthy hadith. So in today's lesson, we're going to focus exclusively on the concept of Islam. We're going to seek to understand the interrelationship and distinctions amongst the three concepts. How does Islam relate to Iman? How does Iman relate to Ihsan? And then we're going to deepen our comprehension on the principles of our faith. So let us read through the narration now bi idnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The narration reads as follows. So it is reported on the authority of Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. So he is the very same companion who narrated the first narration. Innam al-a'malu bin niyya. Actions are judged by the intentions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us, grant you and me the best of intentions. So Umar narrates this particular narration. He is known as Amirul Mu'minin, the leader of the believers. He is known as Al-Faruq, from the word Furqan, which means to distinguish between that which is right and that which is wrong. Now, he was also the 52nd person to have accepted Islam, and we know during his Khilafat there was a great expansion in terms of the Islamic empire, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So he narrates this narration and he says, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٍ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وسلم. بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٍ عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Whilst we were sitting with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم. And another, another narration tells us that this happened to be in the mosque, in a house of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would be the mosque in Medina, the Prophet's mosque, that day one day. إِذْ طَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلٌ When a person happened upon us, what was the appearance of this particular person? شَدِيدُ بَيَاضُ الثِّيَابِ he had white clothing on. Not only was it white, but it was starkly white. Stark white clothing. Shadidu by Shadidu Sawadi Shari. Jet black hair. So stark white clothing and jet black hair. La yura alayhi atharu safar. No telltale signs of traveling were found upon him. Not disheveled, not dusty. None of the telltale signs. And then, wala ya'rifu minna ahadun. None of us knew him. So, there's no sign of him being a traveler, but at the same time, paradoxically, none of us know him. حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم Up until he said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم فأسند ركبتي إلى ركبتي Then he joined his knees to the knees of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ووضع كفي على فخذيه And what did he do? He took his palms and he placed it upon the he placed it upon the thighs of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I'm just going to sit like Jibreel sat when he came into the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So then he said to him, Ya Muhammad, and according to another narration, it says, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Muhammad, peace be upon you, O Muhammad. So just think about this in terms of that particular narration which comes in an nasai It says, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam saw Jibreel. Jibreel came and he said, Adnu, should I come closer? This is the etiquette of the student. Should I come closer? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, Udnu. Then he comes a bit nearer. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asked, Adnu, can I come a bit more closer? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, Udnu, come closer. So he comes up until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and then he asks him the following question. What is the question? Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam, that inform me about Islam. Here you would notice that he says, Ya Muhammadu. We may touch on this point later, but it comes to mind now, so I'll mention it now. The Prophet وسلم, in terms of Quran, when Allah addresses the Prophet وسلم, he does not address him by his first name, 
but rather he's addressed by his title. And what is the title? Ya ayyu al-Nabi, Ya ayyu al-Rasul, Ya ayyu al-Muddathir, Ya ayyu al-Muzammil, and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So why is it that Jibreel alayhi salam says Ya Muhammad calling him by his first name? There are two explanations, or there are a number of explanations. One of the explanations is that this was before those verses were revealed, which says, لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول كدعاء بعضكم بعضا. Don't make the calling out to the messenger like you call out to one another because he's not an ordinary person. He is the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So that's one explanation. The other explanation could be that the rules that apply to you and me as human beings doesn't necessarily apply to the to the angels. And therefore Jibreel alayhi salam addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as Ya Muhammad. Okay. So that's the narration that we're going to be covering for today bi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a bit extra to it, but let's first look at the lessons contained in this part of the narration. So the first lesson which is highlighted here is that uh, the saying goes la yura alayhi athar safari as opposed to la nara we did not see so was not seen upon him the the signs of traveling as opposed to we did not see the signs of traveling upon him there's a difference between the two what is the difference la nara means that we didn't see there might have been signs of traveling upon him but we didn't see it but the wording is more emphatic la yura even if you wanted to see even if you were looking even if you were uh, investigating and you were really looking for signs of travel, la yura, it would not be seen upon him. Why? Because this was not a traveler as such. Now, in the narration of an in terms of his appearance, the following is stated, Ahsanu nasi wajhan. Here in this narration, it just talks about his clothing, stark white clothing and jet black hair. That's basically what is contained over, over here. But in another narration, it says, Ahsanu nasi wajhan. He was the most beautiful of people in terms of his appearance. We'll come to learn later that this is the etiquette of a student. That when you come to class, that you um, that you improve your appearance by removing any of those natural excesses. You trim your moustache, uh, you, you trim your beard, you uh, perfect your appearance, you beautify your appearance. Why? Because Jibril, who came as a student, as, as a teacher, he came in a perfect form, in his most optimum form, Ahsanu nasi wajan, the most beautiful of faces. Wa atyabu nasi rihan. And he had this most fragrant perfume emanating from him. So likewise, as we will see in a moment, for a student and a teacher, when you find yourself in a class setting, you come in to learn or you come in to teach, then it is recommended that you apply some sweet smelling or fragrant smelling perfume. Ka'anna thiyabahu la yamussuha danasun. When it came to the clothing of Jibreel, as if la yamassuha, no Dirt had tainted his clothing. So again, to come to a gathering of learning in clean clothing. So the lessons are bound as we explained a moment ago. We'll quickly run through them again in the next slide. بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى. It reads as follows. So it is recommended for you to come to clean clothing that is very apparent from the narration. Then to beautify oneself by removing excesses. Perfume for entering the masjid or upon scholars. So when you enter into the masjid, perfume yourself before you come. If you go into a gathering of learning and teaching, then perfume yourself. I would even say, if it is that you are studying online, before you go to that space where you're sitting in, there's no direct physical uh, contact. It's not face to face, but that is still referred to as a sitting of learning and teaching. Before you come into that space, Beautify yourself, apply some apply some sweet smelling perfume. Then it is recommended to wear white. Ibn Hajar mentions that on most religious occasions, it is recommended that you wear white. Jumu'ah, for example, it is recommended that you wear white. However, on the day of Eid, festivities. Festivities is best manifested by colorful uh, clothing. So therefore, it is recommended on the days of festivity. As opposed to wearing white, a person wears color clothing. And Allah SWT knows, knows best. The last lesson here would be perfuming for both students as well as the, the teacher. We move on to the next lesson. لا يعرف منا أحد So again, if you look back at this particular narration, that... A person came, stark white clothing, jet black hair, no telltale signs of traveling, but لا يعرف من أحد None of us knew him. Why didn't any of the companions know him? Because he was an angel. So he was an angel in a human form. So this also presents us with the opportunity to learn a bit more about the angels because believing in the angels is important. It is part and parcel of our tenets of faith. If we look at the kalimat that the formulae that indicate to our belief. What does it read as? 
آمنت بالله كما هو بأسمائي وصفاتي وقبلت جميع أحكامه I believe in Allah with all of his names and with all of his qualities and I accept all of his laws If you expound on that it reads as آمنت بالله I believe in Allah وملائكته and in his angels وكتبه ورسوله واليوم الآخر والقدر خيري وشري من الله تعالى والبعت بعد الموت So importantly I believe in Allah and I believe in his angels Here's an angel coming into the company of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم What are angels? This is none other than the archangel Jibreel alayhi salam. So what are they? Our scholars explain that they are adsamun latifatun. They are made up of subtle bodies. They are subtle entity, nuraniyya. Adsamun latifatun nuraniyatun. They are subtle bodies made up of, of light, akhyarun. They are the choices of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation by definition. Yaf'aluna ma yu'marun. La ya'asuna Allah ma amarahum wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun. They do not disobey Allah in the least and they do that which they have been commanded for. Therefore, by definition, they are considered to be choice. Uh, sight, uh, 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 subtle, illuminated beings, in other words, beings made of light, subtle beings created from light. They are choice beings. The wuquwatin azimatin. They have prodigal strength which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, had granted them. And of the peculiarities, of the idiosyncrasies is the fact that they are able to take on different forms. And in this particular instance, we see that they take on a, a, a human form. Generally, where is the abode? The abode is in the heavens unless they are dispatched to this worldly realm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So these angels that are made up of these light uh, phenomenon. They are created from light. Subtle beings created from, from light. When they take on the form, what actually happens? So these light um, phenomenon that they are created from, there's a restriction of this particular light particles. And then what happens? Once that restriction occurs, then they take on a form, whichever form they seek to adopt. And that is how scientifically they morph, they transform from those light beings and they take on another, another form. And in our example, it is, the, it is the human form. In this particular instance, they didn't recognize Jibreel a.s. Typically and generally you would find that Jibreel a.s. would come in the form of a particular companion, Dihya al-Kalbi. But in this particular instance, he did not adopt that that form. So yes, generally you would come in the form of Tihya al-Kalbi and then you could say that the companions would know that this is Jibreel alayhi salam or alternatively he could come in a, another form and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So now we have a good idea in terms of what's happening, what is playing out in front of us. Yes, Jibreel alayhi salam coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He's coming with a few questions. He's going to ask a few questions and then he's going to approve the answer as we will see in a moment but it's coming as a questioner so this talks to the idea of how should a student come to a teacher when asking a, a question and this is very important and quite unique he must come across strongly in other words confidently if you have a question ask الاثنان لا يتعلمان the two that do not learn المستحي والمتكبر the one who is shy and the one who is proud may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from the from the proud ones and we shouldn't develop a degree of bashfulness that it prevents us from asking questions. So he must come across strongly, confidently. He mustn't preoccupy himself with any distractions from his intent. Jibril came and he focused on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Muhammad, adnu udnu. Adnu udnu. Adnu udnu. Come closer, come closer, come closer. He's focused. I have a question. I need to ask the teacher a question and he does exactly that. The jurist consult should not take issue with this purposefulness even though the apparent etiquette is not adhered to, and Allah SWT knows, knows best. So the narration goes on now. Jibreel now is in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His knees are joined to the knees of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His palms are on the thighs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does he say? أَخْبِدْنِ عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ Inform me about Islam. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِ سَلَمْ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded by saying, Al-Islam, Islam is أَن تَشْهَدَ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الله. That you be witness that there is no deity worthy of worship besides Allah. And that Muhammad is his messenger, is the messenger of Allah. وَتُقِيمَ الصَّلَةِ According to others, they read it as وَتُقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ And that you establish the prayer. وَتُؤْتِيَ الزَّكَاةَ And that you pay the alms tax. وَتَصُومَ رَمَضَانِ And you fast the month of Ramadan. وَتَحُجَّ الْبَيْتِ And you perform the pilgrimage. إِنْ اسْتَطَعْتَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا If you are able to. قال then Jibreel uniquely said, Sadaqta, you are speaking the truth. He's asking the question, he gets the answer, and then he verifies the answer. This is quite strange, because why is it strange? Because a student is coming on the premise that he does not know. When he receives the answer, he approves the answer as if he knows. So 
he doesn't know or he does know. This seemed to be very contradictory. And for that reason, فَعَجِبْنَا لَهُ The companion said, we were astounded. What's going on? يَسْأَلُهُ وَيُصَدِّقُهُ That he asks and then he approves the, the, the answer. So what do we find now? أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ So this part of the narration, inshallah, like we unpacked the first part of the narration, we're going to do exactly the same in relation to this part of the narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willing. So there's another form of the narration and that form of the narration doesn't have the wording أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ It has the form of wording which is مَلْ Islam. What is Islam? So now very importantly, in the Arabic language you have different instruments in order to ask a question. In the English language it is a question mark and where does the question mark appear? At the end of a sentence. In the Arabic language the question mark would appear at the beginning of the sentence. So here in this narration it says مَلْ Islam. What is Islam? Excuse me. So the instrument ma, which is used to ask a question, it is used to ask after the essence of something. What is it? In other words, essentially, what is it? What is it made up of? And so this is the question which the Prophet وسلم, is being asked. What is Islam? In other words, what is the essence of Islam? And he's going to give a particular answer. So what do we understand from Islam? There's a literal meaning to it. What does it mean literally? At-ta'atu wal inqiyad. It means to, to obey and to follow. So a Muslim, literally a Muslim, um, very literally, I could be a Muslim to you, you could be a Muslim to me. What does it mean literally? That if I command you to do something, you follow through. Now, in other words, obedience. That's basically what Islam means. Now, technically, what does Islam refer to? al inqiyad ila al-a'mal al It refers to you obeying Allah in as far as the apparent acts of worship are concerned. So the first thing we're going to look at would be an tashhada an la ilaha illallah that you bear witness. This is a nutq wa nutq fi al-khulfu bi tahqiqi says Imam Ibrahim al-Laqani. So to utter, to pronounce this particular testification, what is it? It is obeying Allah, and the act of obedience is manifested externally. In other words, on your, on your, on your limbs. And this is basically what Islam is: obedience in as far as external worship is concerned. That is what Islam is all about, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows knows best. So the interesting part here, and this is a very simple issue really, but the scholars discuss it and they have interesting discussions about it. The first pillar of Islam, so to say, would be shahadat Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. Is it necessary when a person enters into the fold of Islam that he has his utterance? Yes, there must be an utterance. Must the utterance include the word shahada or ashhadu? Must ashhadu be mentioned? So when we look at the narration that we are busy with, the apparent states what? The apparent is that in Islam, it is necessary to have the phrase, I bear witness. Because the Prophet ﷺ tells us, what is Islam? وَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ Inform me about Islam. What does he say? He says that, أَن تَشْهَدْ That you say, أَشْهَدُ In other words, an individual must therefore say, I be witness that there is no God but Allah, and I be witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So based on this particular narration, you would say that, in order for that pronouncement to be valid, that formula to be valid, it must incorporate the words Ashadu. However, there's another narration. أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقَاتِلَ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَقُولُ um, I've been commanded to contend with people until they say. So here, the word shahada is not being used, but the word to say is being used. So if you look at that particular narration, the narration that reads until they say indicates that the word ashadu is not stipulated. And then, the, the opinion according to Ibn Hajar and Imam Nawawi rahimahullah is that in order for the testification, those two testifications, the testification that there is no God worthy of worship besides Allah and the testification that Muhammad is his messenger, that particular testification does not need necessarily to have the words ashadu. That's our practice that we say ashadu, but it's not necessary for a person to have it. So if a person says, for example, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah or Ahmad Rasulullah, then he's... Um, Testification would be valid and Allah SWT knows, knows best. What's the argument for that? The argument for that reads as follows. So our scholars say, um, I see there's a bit of a cut off on it, no problem. So our scholars say that when a person says, Aman to Billah, that I believe in Allah, Aman to Billah, and the likes, um, then that is sufficient. So if a person says, Aman to Billah, remember we quoted earlier in the class that we have this kalimat. So we have Iman Mujmal and we have Iman Mufassal. In as far as the example of Iman Mujmal was concerned, 
What did we say? Amantu billahi kama huwa bi asma'i wa sifati wa qabiltu jami' ahkamihi. Or we would say Amantu billahi wa malaikati wa kutubi wa rusuli wal yawm al akhir wal qadri khairi wa sharri min Allah ta'ala wal ba'thi ba'd al mawt. So in as far as the first part of the declaration of faith is concerned, our scholars say if a person says Amantu billah, I believe in Allah, would that be sufficient? They say it would be sufficient. So if it is sufficient for a person to say Amantu billah, as opposed to Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, then it should be sufficient for him simply to delete Ashadu and say la ilaha illallah. And Allah SWT knows, knows best. There's another example which they which they look at. Let me try to go. There's another example that they look at and that example would be Allahu Khaliqi. If a person says Allahu Khaliqi or Allahu Rabbi, um, would it suffice? It would, it would suffice. Now, why? Because we look at the meaning as opposed to the to the word and therefore the scholars do not worship via the formulae and therefore many variables are, are permitted and I think this is an important point for us to understand in principle a person accepts Islam he must buy into the meaning and he doesn't need to necessarily adhere to a particular formulae so therefore if a, if a person says Allahu bari'i Allahu khaliqi Allah is my creator Allah is my originator Allah is the one who brought me from non existence into existence he says that representing uh, the meaning of the first part of the declaration, then, then, that would, then, then that would suffice. And Muhammad Rasuli, Ahmad Nabiyyi, and so forth, then that would suffice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows, knows best. There are certain other considerations which I think is also very important. So just to wrap up the previous discussion, is it necessary to have the words Ashhadu in the declaration? No, it is not necessary. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. There are, however, other important considerations. What are, are they? They read as follows. Number one is, that you need to have both testifications. If a person simply says, La ilaha illallah, that doesn't get him into the fold of Islam because the declaration of faith is made up of two parts and the one part is not complete without, without the other part. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. In order for a person to enter into the fold of Islam, he needs to utter both parts and Allah SWT knows, knows best. Number two, it is also stipulated that the sequence is followed. If a person says, Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. It would not be valid. Why? Because the proper sequence was not followed. The next issue is that succession is not stipulated. What do we mean thereby? If a person says now, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, he goes and he comes back after five minutes and he says, Wa Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. There was a lapse between the first part of the declaration and the second part of the declaration. No problem. His declaration is intact and Allah SWT knows, knows best. Last but not least, it's very important to understand that Arabic is not stipulated in terms of the declaration. If a person says exactly the same thing in English or in Afrikaans or any other language, it would still be considered valid. It doesn't have to be in Arabic and Allah SWT knows, knows best. So we continue now. The next part, so antashhada an la ilaha illallah wa tuqima salah wa tuqima salah That is read in one of two ways. It could be read an tuqima salah with a fatha. It could also be read an tuqima وَتُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ with a, with, a, with a dhamma and both readings would add different meanings the important part here would be that when we look at Islam there's a minimum requirement and then there's a complete requirement so the minimum requirement in order for you to enter into the fold of Islam is for you to say I bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship besides Allah and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger the moment a person has that minimum he has now entered into the fold of Islam Thereafter, he has the minimum. If he doesn't pray, if he doesn't uh, offer the alms tax, if he doesn't fast, if he doesn't perform the pilgrimage, he is still considered a Muslim, albeit a minimum Muslim. However, if a person wants to be a complete Muslim, then in order for him to be a complete Muslim, he has to manifest not only the utterance of the declaration, but all of the other pillars of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. But it's important to keep in mind because it's a very practical discussion. Uh, we want to keep more people within the fold of Islam. And when do you become a Muslim and when are you considered to be within the fold of Islam? The moment you utter the declaration. But that very importantly is the minimum. You must complete it by doing what? By following through on the other aspects of worship. And what is the most important aspect of worship thereafter? It is going to be Salah. So here our scholars look at Salah. So in other words, you have made a declaration. You must follow through on that declaration. What is the most important manifestation of that meaning which was uttered in the declaration, is for you to pray. So where does the word prayer come from? Our scholars have the following discussion. 
Some scholars say it comes from the word, the word tuqim as salah tuqim. So we're going to be looking at that particular verb, the word tuqim. Where does it come from? Some scholars say it comes from the word taqweem and ta'adil, which basically means to keep things in balance. In terms of our prayer, why do we pray five times a day so that we can keep the 24 hours of our day in, in balance? Other scholars say, no, it comes from the word iqama. Tuqim comes from the word iqama. And what does it mean? It means mulazama to stick to something, to adhere to something and do it consistently. We pray five times a day and we pray five times a day consistently. Others say it comes from the meaning of tashmir and nuhud. In other words, to stand up to something. Why? Because five times a day we stand up in order to pray our salah. Others say, no, it comes from iqama, which is the sister of the adhan. And according to Ibn Hajar al he says that is incorrect and Allah SWT knows, knows best. So, Islam is what? We are Muslims. What does it mean? That we utter the declaration and we establish the, the prayer. What is the prayer? Literally, the prayer means as-salah. The word salah means dua, to pray. But technically, what does it refer to? It refers to aqwalun, certain utterances, wa af'alun, and certain actions. Muftatihatun bit takrim takbir, which starts off by saying Allahu Akbar and which concludes by saying Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah and Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. This is what we refer to as the as the as the prayer. So that is the first principle, it is the first pillar of Islam. We move on to the second one. The second one is referred to as zakah. So we know zakah to translate as the arms tax. It is a specific amount of money that is due on certain types of, of wealth. What are those types of, of wealth? By consensus, the scholars say that zakah is binding upon livestock, dates, grapes, cereals, gold and, and silver. And then it applies also to merchandise and other fruits, but scholars differ in the latter category. But there is a, there is a consensus in terms of the former category. So the first pillar after the declaration of faith is to pray. That means fulfilling the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second pillar is to pay the arm sticks. That is to fulfill the rights of your fellow creation. And that's basically the sum total of our Islam. Like Fakhruddin al-Razi says, that it can be encapsulated in one phrase. Worshipping the creator in terms of salah and fulfilling the rights of your fellow creation. In other words, zakah. And this is basically what our Islam is all about. Serving our creator and being of service to our fellow creation and Allah SWT knows knows best. Now the word zakah, what does it mean? Literally it refers to annama growth and tatheer and purification because ma naqasad sadaqatun malan that giving charity has never decreased wealth but rather it increases it. The word zakah means to increase. So ostensibly it may appear that you are decreasing in terms of your wealth but in reality you are increasing your wealth as we will see in a moment. And then technically what does it refer to? What does zakah refer to? Ismun uh, it refers to that amount of money that you extract from your wealth and you pay that is referred to as zakah it is a certain amount of money a specified amount of money generally 2.5% taken from certain types of wealth and given to certain types of, of people that's basically what zakah is all about and now we look at the connection between why is zakah why is zakah called zakah? We looked at the meaning now. Zakah means to grow and zakah means to purify. What is the correlation between the, between the two? We find the following. Why? Because you nammi al-amwal bil barakah. It increases the wealth in terms of, of, of blessing. And it also increases your good deeds by multiplying it. Uh, another meaning would be that it purifies you, it purifies you or it purifies your wealth. You have an amount of wealth. You don't know what the sources of these wealth have, have come from. It may have come to you legitimately, but it may have been tainted prior to coming to you. So you want to purify that wealth. How do you purify that wealth? By dispensing the alms tax. And Allah SWT knows, knows best. Uh, another meaning would be that يُطَهِرُ نَفْسَ الْمُزَكِّي مِنْ رَضِيدَةِ الْبُخْلِ It purifies the soul of the person dispensing of the alms tax. What is it purifying from him in this particular abstract manner? It purifies him from the abstract vice of uh, niggardliness, of miseriness. And Allah SWT knows, knows best. Last but not least, it is a testimony, yuzaki. So the word tazkiyah is also means like a ta'adil, when you do a vindication of a person, when you put a tick next to the person's name. So the fact that the person is paying him arms tax, what does that indicate to? It indicates that his claim to being a Muslim is submitted to the law of Allah SWT. That's a valid claim and therefore we put a tick next to the person's name and Allah SWT knows, knows best. The next 
pillar of Islam that we're going to be dealing with would be the pillar relating to fasting. What does fasting mean? Fasting literally means al-imsak. Imsak means to hold something back. Um, the word imsak, for example, yeah, I have a glass of water. I'd like to drink some as well. I'm holding it in my hand. This is called imsak. So, akhlu shay to take something with your hand and um, and hold it. That's basically what the word imsak means literally. So, imsak means to hold or if you wanted to, to withhold. Technically, what does it refer to? Imsakun maksusun. It is a specific type of withholding yourself. Withholding yourself from what? From food, drink and conjugal relations from daybreak up until sunset. That's basically what the word, that's basically what the word so means. Now in the narration, the Prophet says, وَتُقِيمَ الصَّلَةِ That you establish the prayer. وَتُؤْتِيَ الزَّكَاةِ And that you pay your arms tax. وَتَصُومَ رمضان And that you fast Ramadan. What do you notice? The word Ramadan is mentioned all on its own. It's not coupled with a mudaf, which is called Shah Ramadan. So scholars differ in this particular regard. Some say it's not permissible. In other words, they consider it reprehensible rather that you use the word Ramadan without attaching the word Shah to it. In other words, you must mention it like it's mentioned in the Quran. Shahru Ramadan al-ladhi unzila fi quran The month of Ramadan. But we find in this narration, what do we find very clearly? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَتَصُومَ Ramadan, And that you fast Ramadan He is using the word Ramadan Without attaching the word month to it So is it permissible? If the Prophet ﷺ did it Then it should be permissible And it is permissible So its usage here Indicates that it is not reprehensible Unrestrictedly In another narration we find The Prophet ﷺ said إِذَا جَاءَ رَمَضَانْ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ Again you notice The word Ramadan is used as a stand a alone is it the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Some scholars argue that it is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore when you use it in a given context, other than referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you must add the word shahr so that there's no confusion. Um, our scholars, the Shafi'i scholars argue about this and they contend that uh, it is not the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because in order to establish a name for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to have a revelatory source. You need to have a Quran. You need to have a narration of the Prophet ﷺ establishing that. And there's no authentic narration that establishes the word Ramadan as a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last of the pillars which we deal with would be Hajj. What does Hajj mean? Hajj literally refers to qast to intend. And technically it refers to al-qast or qast to al-bayt nusuk To intend the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to perform the ritual acts of, of worship. As Shafi'is, we include Umrah as well. So the Prophet ﷺ in this particular narration, what does he say? He says... وَتَحُجَّ الْبَيْتِ And that you perform the hajj of the house. We as Shafi'is, we include Umrah as well. Why do we do that? In Quran, it appears that وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ And complete the hajj and the umrah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's an authentic narration that the Prophet sallallahu is asked هَلْ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ جَهَادٌ Is there a form of combat for a human folk? The Prophet sallallahu says, yes. Uh, jihadun la qitala fi. There's a type of combat in which there is no fighting. Al Hajj wal Umrah, and that refers to the Hajj and the Umrah, clearly indicating to us that, like Hajj is compulsory at least once in a lifetime, similarly Umrah is compulsory as as well. But now, in terms of Hajj, specifically in this narration, the Prophet says, manistata'a ilayhi sabila, for the person who has the ability to actually fulfill it. So here we have a number of interesting notes which the scholars make in this particular regard. And what is that? That every pillar, you are morally responsible and duty-bound to do it on condition that you are able to. So it applies to all of the pillars. But the Prophet only mentions it in relation to Hajj. Why is why is that? So that's one of the questions that we're going to answer in the following slide. So firstly, Manistata ilayhi sabila means that um, the person must have the ability in terms of provision, provision for himself going and coming, and provisions for those whom he is responsible for in terms of maintenance. Now, so once he has the provision for himself to go and come, and there's enough provision to see to those that he is responsible for, then it's compulsory upon him. And over and above that, he must have a, a, a conveyance. So now we move to the second point. What is the second point? The second point is all about وَإِنَّمَا قَيَّدَ بِالْإِسْتِطَاعَةِ فِي الْحَجِّ مَا أَنَّمَا مَرَّ مُقَيَّدٌ بِهِ أَيْضًا um, The ability is only mentioned in Hajj in as far as the narration is concerned. But it applies to all of the other acts as well. 
So why does the Prophet Sallallahu do that year? Why does he add this qualification of Manistata the person who has the ability to do it? Why does he only do it in terms of Hajj? He only does it because Ittiba'an lil Qur'an Following the pattern set by the Qur'an What pattern was set by the Qur'an? Allah says um, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا And for Allah is the pilgrimage for the person who has the ability to do so. So when Allah talks about prayer and Allah talks about the arms tax and Allah talks about the prayer, He doesn't uh, qualify it in the way that He's qualified the, the Hajj. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best. So because Allah qualifies it like that, the Prophet also qualifies it. Alternatively, there's another meaning that can be attached here. And that is that, look... Um, being morally responsible entails a degree of difficulty. However, uh, the degrees of difficulty, they differ from one act of worship to another act of worship. So because the difficulty in Hajj is much more, comparatively speaking, relatively speaking, to the other acts of worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the fact that it is only compulsory upon the person who has the ability in light of the difficulty that Hajj entails and Allah SWT knows, knows best. The last point which Ibn Hajj mentions here is also quite important and I'm going to read that from the, from the slide. وَإِذًا فَإِنَّ عَدَمَهَا فِي نَحْوِ الصَّلَاةِ um, The inability when it comes to prayer and fasting, so the word inability is not mentioned in relation to those things. Why? Because لا يُسْقِطُ فَضَّى بِالْكُلِيَةِ doesn't cause the obligation to fall away completely. Whereas in Hajj, uh, because a person doesn't have the ability, then the obligation falls away completely. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows, knows best. The next question we look at is, can Islam and Iman be separated from one another? And this is a very important question. So our scholars say, quite simple to understand that Iman can be separated from Islam. What is Iman? Iman is tasdiq bil qalb. That you, um, that you attest to the truthfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahabi wa sallam. So it is something which happens internally. It's located within your heart. Can this be separated from Islam? Yes, a person is lying on his deathbed and he attests with his heart to the truthfulness and the veracity and he accepts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as his Lord and he accepts the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his messenger and he passes away, what happens? Did he do anything? Did he make shahada? Did he make salah? Did he make zakah? Did he make saum? Did he make hajj? No, he didn't. So iman can be separated from Islam. However, Islam cannot be separated from iman. And why is this? Because in order for an act of worship to be valid, its validity is pending on the belief of the person. So it's not possible for you to manifest an act of Islam uh, without having established the basis for it, which is the Iman, which is in your heart, and Allah SWT knows, knows best. So that brings us to an end of our lesson. And before we end, we have a few questions. What is Islam? What is the literal, literal meaning and shari meaning of Islam? We've covered that in quite a bit of detail, alhamdulillah. The literal meaning of and the shari meaning of Islam. What does it mean? Uh, can Iman be separated from Islam? That's the last issue that we dealt with now. Um, in summary, we covered the etiquette of learning and teaching. We looked at Jibreel as a central figure and the lessons that can be gleaned from him, portraying what it means to be a student and a, a teacher. And also we deepened our comprehension of the integrals of Islam by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that brings us to an end of this lesson till we meet in the next part of Hadith Jibreel. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.